This is a slide of parathyroid tumors, and it's here for me to help uh, you uh, think about parathyroid disease as a disease of parathyroid tumors. Um, we've, uh, we've noticed over the years that endocrinologists are some of the smartest in intellectual. You guys, you guys proud yourself, pride yourselves in the intellectual manner in which you take care of your patients, which is, uh, which is always great for your patients, and we love it as well. Sometimes uh, the endocrinologist doesn't see this very often. They overthink primary hyperparathyroidism, and they're always trying to find a reason to make it hyperplasia. And uh, because you deal with uh, other diseases which are not actually caused by tumors like diabetes, um, there's a tendency we see in a lot of a, a lot of endocrinologists don't see this very often is they're looking for hyperplasia. Maybe there's some external force. I'm going to talk about this several times today. These external forces that are acting upon the parathyroid glands, which makes them big and juicy and become hyperplastic and then become autonomous. I'm here to tell you that that doesn't happen. Great discussion, but it doesn't happen. When we operate on people, we're looking for tumors. We're not looking for hyperplasia. Hyperplasia is very rare. People with parathyroid tumors, have, people with parathyroid disease, people with primary hyperparathyroidism have parathyroid tumors. That's why we send you pictures. I'm sure almost everybody in this room has got a picture from us, and the reason we send you pictures is so you can see what it is. It's a, it's a tumor. We don't send pictures of multiple glands. In the data that we've been showing here, our 10,000 patients, uh, our most recent 10,000 patients, it represents 1,445 different endocrinologists. Um, that's 33% of the endocrinologists in the United States have sent us a patient, and uh, about 83% of the 289 uh, uh, endocrinologists in the state of Florida. Um, we currently uh, perform in the low 70s, 72 or so percent of all the parathyroid operations in the state of Florida, and about 11% of all the parathyroid operations in, this, in the United States. Um, as noted before, we do about, about 45% of our patients come from the state of Florida, and about 55% come from outside the state of Florida. So we are kind of like big brother. We get to see who gets 24-hour te urine tests and who doesn't. Who mentions FHA, FHH in their, uh, in their workup and who doesn't. We get to know. We get to follow who gets vitamin D and who doesn't. And we know who gets scans, what scans you get, how many you get, how often you get them. We know how often you follow patients. We get to follow all that stuff in our database. <clears throat> and the good news is that you guys are better than the rest of the country a number of things. Let's look at a couple of different issues that you guys are better at. How, how, how 1,400 endocrinologists who have sent us a patient, how they worked up primary hyperparathyroidism before they sent it to the surgeon, or didn't send it and the patient self referred. Total number of office visits. In, in Florida, 9% nine, 9 of the patients are sent to us after one visit with an endocrinologist. Only 2% in the rest of the United States are sent to a surgeon after one, one clinic visit. There are some of you in here who never see a patient a second time. They refer all. I know who you guys are. Two visits, 39% in Florida. So the, so the most of you, either two visits or three visits, that's, that's the mean here. Those of you who are in this room will are sent a patient with primary hyperparathyroidism. Most of you will see a patient two or three times. You'll, you'll see them, you'll take a history, you'll do the workup, you order some tests, you see them back one more time, maybe do one more test, do a few things. You see them either two or three times before you send them to, the, send them to a surgeon. In the rest of the United States, you see the mean is, you know, up here three or, or greater than four visits. Greater than four visits, that doesn't happen very often in Florida. So you guys are dramatically statistically better at evaluating, looking at these patients. You spend less money working up a parathyroid patient and move those patients uh, more quickly to surgery. Meaning, of course, you know some of the data that Doug has already talked about. How endocrinologists work up primary parathyroidism? Total number of scans obtained on first visit. 8% of endocrinologists get zero scans on their first visit. 11% get one scan. 79% of American endocrinologists will order two scans at the very first visit. 
2% get three or more. Now this is typically, they'll come into the office, some endocrinologists will do the ultrasound themselves and then send them out for a sesame scan. The vast majority of them will get a prescription for an ultrasound. I think you get parathyroid disease, your calcium's high. Here's a prescription for an ultrasound. Here's a prescription for a sesame scan. Go get those done and come back in, in two months and you're gonna get your labs done again. In Florida, that's significantly better. Fewer scans are obtained by you guys than your counterparts across the country. Highly statistically significant. Uh, this would go out to like seven zeros if we wanted to with the, with the data that we have. And fewer visits required to make the diagnosis. So you guys all should be very proud. You guys are more hip to this disease than your counterparts. We're gonna look at seven different areas of confusions, things that cause you to cause you and your peers across the country to come to the office multiple times, okay, instead of just one visit, multiple times. First one, FHH. In 2003, 88% of the cases referred to us made a reference, the endocrinologist made a reference to, we're gonna rule out FHH by doing XXX. In 2010, only 19% make a reference to ruling out FHH. So you guys have become much less dependent upon that. You don't talk about it as much as you do. It's not as cool and fat as it used to be. What's cool and fat, as we'll talk about later, is vitamin D. Back in 2003, none of you measured vitamin D. Now you all measure vitamin D, and that's going to be confusionary number six that we're going to talk about. So things have changed. As we're monitoring what you guys do over the years, things are changing. You don't do what you did five, six, eight years ago. 21% of the endocrinologists in the United States, when they send us a patient, do not obtain 24-hour urine calcium tests. Let's look at, again, we're, we're, we're talking about confusionary one, FHH. The concept, as we've all been taught, is that when you get a 24-hour urine test, A, you're supposed to be able to tell you who's at risk for stones and who's not. And Doug and I, hopefully by now, have put that to rest. But the other reason you get these 24-hour urine tests is gonna help you distinguish who's got FHH and who doesn't. Again, I'm beating a dead horse, allow me to beat it again. We see this every day. We do 13 of these operations a day. We see this at least once a day where somebody's got a, a, PTA, a, a 24-hour urine test of 99 or 97 or whatever, and they, that's it. You can't have parathyroid surgery. Yeah, your calcium's 11.7, and yeah, your PTH is 240, but your 24-hour urine calcium is 69, that means you've got FHH. It's not true, folks. You guys, I think, know it, but it's, uh, it's simply not true. So FHH cannot be distinguished from primary hyperparathyroidism by getting a 24-hour urine test. The age-old teaching is not correct. You were taught it by your mentors, and your mentors taught it by somebody else. That data is old data. FHH is only detectable for genetic testing, and I'm going to tell you here, this is the first time you're going to hear it, I'm going to tell you right here that genetic te testing is, is of questionable value. Those of you who have ever got a genetic testing for FHH, you'll, you'll get a four-page result that says this could be this, could be this, but it's variable, it could be this, there are some people who do this, some people who do that, some people show this expression, some people don't. You know why? Because in that database, people who have FHH are people who have primary parathyroidism but their 24-hour urine tests are low, okay? So I'm telling you, even, the, even this has questionable value because the database of who has SHH by genetic testing includes people who don't have it, people who have a parathyroid tumor. Most of you will never see it. A patient with high, I don't know that I've ever seen it. I think I've seen it once. And we see, we consult on about 3,300 high calcium patients per year. And I'm not sure that truly I've ever seen it. A patient with high serum calcium levels and low urine calcium levels, okay, let me say it again. A patient with high serum calcium levels and low urine calcium levels is much more, almost exclusively, more likely to have primary hyperparathyroidism and FHH. If their PTH is anything but low, in other words, low, and we'll talk about that later, low is low. Low is not 35, low is not 40, low is not 29, low is low, low is 7, low is 10, okay? 